2016, 17 academic year, which means we're almost done with the school year, which for a lot of people I'm sure will be great. Um, I think everyone in here pretty much knows me, but I'm Rebecca Vandevoord, Vice President of Academic Outreach and Innovation, and I am going to introduce today Jennifer Robinson, who drove down from Spokane just to present to us in person. Jennifer is a um, clinical associate professor in pharmacy up in the College of Pharmacy, and she has her Doctor of Pharmacy from WSU, so she's a WSU student, and her um, she's done a couple of faculty-led workshops for us. Her focus um, is team-based learning. So, welcome, Jennifer. Great, thank you, Rebecca. I do have a mic. It's on. It's it's behind the hair, so I'm hoping that it's working. Thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your busy schedules. I always believe that the end of this, the semester is going to be calm. And then I reach the end of the semester and it feels like it's total chaos. So thank you for taking time out of that total chaos to be here with me today. So today during the session, we're going to be talking about team-based learning. And part of the session, I'm going to ask you to log into Socrative, which is a quizzing platform uh, that I use extensively within some of the courses that I teach. So if you have a phone or if you have a computer, I would encourage you to log in and then we'll use it during uh, the part of the presentation. If you haven't quite gotten logged in yet, it's okay. I'll bring up these websites again. So when I was thinking about the best way to present information about team-based learning, I wanted to pick a topic that I thought everybody in the room had an equal chance of being not an expert in. So I have my doctor of pharmacy degree. I know a whole lot about drugs. I don't know a lot about peppers. So I thought this was a really good topic and something that would be fun to talk about. Uh, Team-based learning, why I became interested in it about a decade ago when I started teaching at WSU. I would come into class, I initially started lecturing to my students, and I noticed some of them were falling asleep during class. I wasn't satisfied with that, so I wanted to try to get them more active. I would create activities for them that I thought were fabulous, and when I tested them in my office, they went really, really well, and then I would take them into class, and nobody would talk, and nobody had completed the pre-readings. I don't know if anybody in here has experienced anything similar, but it, it seems to be a pretty common issue. So I was griping about some of my problems to one of my colleagues, and they brought up team-based learning. And they really encouraged me to look into it and to identify what team-based learning is, because they thought the structure of it could really address some of the issues that I was having in my classroom. So I did, I implemented it, and I really enjoyed team-based learning. It allowed me to get into the space between my students' ears and figure out what they were thinking. And we had quite a bit of fun in class. And when you walk into my classroom, it can be kind of a, a loud and chaotic place, which I think from a learning perspective is a good thing. Uh, so team-based learning, I'm going to go over really quickly the instructional activity sequence for team-based learning. And then I have condensed this into a about a 40 minute process so that we can go through an entire team-based sequence here today so you can experience what it feels like to be a student in a team-based learning classroom. So before class, the students do some individual study. That can be a mixture of um, like uh, readings, maybe narrated PowerPoints, worksheets that the students have to go through so that they are prepared for class. Uh, the readiness, insurance, uh, readiness assurance and application of course concepts, those are the two parts that happen within class. So with the readiness assurance process, once students come into class, the first thing that they do is they put all of their notes away and they sit down and they take an individual test about what they've learned outside of class. Once they've completed that individual test, they get into a group, they take that exact same test again, and they get immediate feedback about what their answers were, so they, they can identify what they know and what they don't know. Uh, if the students believe that I have done a terrible job, either with the pre-class work or with some of the 
questions on the initial assessment, they can appeal at this time uh, some of the items on the test and try to get some points back. That stops students from coming to my office after class and trying to argue for points. And then before we move on to the application exercises, I try to clarify with the students any questions or concerns or confusion that was brought up by the introductory material. Once we're done with that, we go right into application exercises. So the students, they re-engage with that team that they took that team test with, and they work through uh, questions and cases and activities together. And then we discuss those as a group in the classroom in real time. So what's the time frame your class? What? With this example, what's the time frame of your class? Uh, uh, I have, I've used this process in a number of different classes. One class that I used it in is a lab-based classroom where I would have uh, anywhere between 100 and 120 students during my tutorial time, and we would complete this during tutorial time, and then I would have about 40 students with me during lab. Uh, before I went to team-based learning, I would have 100, 120 students during tutorial time, and I would have 20 students who were in lab. So by using this process, I was able to expand the number of students in my lab-based course because the conversation went better. Uh, I've also used this approach in a Introduction to Therapeutics Top 200 Drug course, where I have 120 students in class with me in a very traditional lecture-based space. So I've used it in a traditional lecture-based and a lab-based course. It works in both. Yes? The individual test and the team test, the question is, are they uh, paper-based or are they web-based? For the individual test, I have used Blackboard or Socrative.com as the individual test place where I have them take that test. For the team test, I have them take it on paper, and then they have an if at scratch card, which we'll look at a little bit later today, and you can experience what that is like. Uh, I was going to, if we had a bigger group, I was going to optimize teams. Within team-based learning, I assign the students two teams, and these teams are permanent, and they go across the entire semester. I do that strategically because I've found with teams that the longer they work together, the better they work together. Because uh, they, what, what are the three stages? They storm, they norm, and then they perform and you can watch that consistently happen. So I do random assignments of the students, but I usually do it strategically. So within my Introduction to Therapeutics course, I will ask students, what, where have you practiced as a pharmacy intern or pharmacy technician before this class? And then I try to get a diversity of backgrounds into each team. Uh, today, I was going to attempt, because we're talking a little bit about peppers and foods, I was going to stratify the teams according to uh, the level of food interest that individual had. Uh, since we have about, I don't know, half a dozen people, a, f a perfect team size, I'm going to ask that everybody here uh, participate. Let me think about this. I'm, oh, hi, Connie. I, I'm going to ask that everybody separate into, let's do groups of three so that we have two separate groups. So I'm going to have Rebecca and Over, and then you and Over will be a separate team. So now let's move on to how hot is that pepper, and we're moving into the team-based learning activity sequence. So here are the objectives of what I want you to learn from the activity we'll be engaging in. Uh, we'll be looking at peppers and looking specifically at heat content, and then we'll be looking at compounds that result in heat sensation, tearing, and the release of endorphins. 
So I am going to hand out a free class assignment. And I've tried to design it so it's like two minutes of reading just for the purposes of today. And Connie, I think I handed this handout to you before I left, so you should have it. So everybody just take about two minutes and read through the pre-work. So as soon as you finished the reading, I'm going to encourage you to put the reading away. So this would be like me asking my students, please put your notes away. Uh, log on to Socrative.com. Here's the room name that you will need to go into. And you can take a, a quick two minute individual readiness assessment test. Has everybody been able to take the assessment? Usually I have two computers up. On one computer I have uh, Socrative.com open and as students are completing their assessments I can track and see how they're doing and it gives me red and green so I can see where students are getting answers right and where students are getting answers wrong. And I believe I should have set up the Socrative so you didn't get any immediate feedback about your answers. Is that correct? Okay, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to move on to the team portion 
of the readiness assurance test process. So for each team, I've given each team two things. I've given you a piece of paper that has the exact same questions that you just saw online, and I've also given you an if at card. And if at, it's the immediate feedback assessment technique card, and it works a lot like a scratch card. So you go to number one, question number one, you talk about it as a team, and then you identify, okay, is the answer A, B, C, or is it D? And then once as a group you've, you've talked about it, you've identified the one that you think is right, you scratch it off, and if you are right, and you have the answer right, you will see a little star. If you're wrong, you'll scratch it off and nothing will be underneath that little space. So if you don't get it the first time, you try and try again. So get, take your first guess. If it's right, if it's a star, move on to the next question. If it's not right, talk again, figure out if there's another option, another answer that could be right. So go ahead and talk about the questions and use those if at cards. These if ats, you can order them. Um, there is a company that creates them, Epstein Educational Enterprises. And on the bottom, I actually left the bottom, and usually I take these off. And there is a form number so that it tells you what form it is. And I have a, a master sheet that tells me for this form number, here's where all of the answers are. So I have to modify my exams to match the if at card that I'm using. So go ahead, talk, scratch away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you just? <laughs> okay, so I want to pause just for a moment and talk about some of the things I observed watching these very newly formed teams. So when you scratched off something and it was right, what was the reaction of the group? Excitement. You heard this like, yes! When you, when you scratched it off and the answer wasn't completely right, what happened? I, I, heard, I heard this groan like, oh no. And something else that I heard is I heard individuals bring up uh, examples from their own lives and describing why they thought that answer was correct. I heard you say, oh, when I, I prepare a food, when I prepare peppers, you're always told to take the seeds out because that's, that's where all of the heat is. And I think I heard a similar comment come from over here. Uh, something else that's pretty common with newly formed teams is there's a little bit of voting. Okay, who thinks it's B, who thinks it's C? Okay, we'll go with the majority. Yep. And students, it's really common for them to do that. And as they move through the course of the semester, you'll finally get to the point where they no longer do that and they look at the evidence, what the why behind why they believe the answer is right, and then they will go with that. So that was the team test. Uh, with these if, these if at cards, I always have the students fill out the top so they'll put their team name on the top. And they also score it as they go. So if they get the answer right on the first scratch, then they get full points, they get one point. If they get it on the second scratch, then they get half points, because they were pretty close. So I give them the benefit of the doubt with that. Uh, research has shown that 
in 99.5% of the cases, the team does better than the individual. And I don't think I've ever had a team do worse than the individual. I've never seen that happen. Just because that collective uh, discussion can really make the groups more effective and more efficient. So I would normally I would collect those scratch cards. I'll leave them with the groups at this point. I have not used clickers, but that's definitely, it's an option. I think there's something fun about the students having to scratch off. Uh, when they bring them up to me, I will tally on the board the different scores that I'm seeing so that the teams can compare to how they're doing against the rest of their class. So if everybody's getting nine points out of 10 and their group got six points out of 10, uh, that is usually a really strong motivator so that the team wants to work harder so that they understand the pre-work material so that they can do better on these initial tests. All semester, same team. Uh, the only reasons that I have stu I allow students to change teams is if somebody in their team is their roommate or a significant other. I don't want people who live together or who are in a serious relationship together. And most of the time when you put them in a random team, they do pretty well. Uh, sometimes they will have some arguments that come up and then it's my job to help mediate those arguments so they can function as a team. Once they're done with the tests, I give them a, where did it go? Oh, here it is. So this is uh, the process for appeals. If the students feel like one of the questions was not a great question, then they can appeal. So the, the appeal has to be based, it either has to be there's ambiguity in the question or there's ambiguity in the readings. So either I didn't prepare them well enough for this assessment or the assessment itself was confusing. Uh, what's nice about having students appeal uh, is one, they do it in real time and they also, when they're appealing, they go back to the material, they review it again and they try to really pick it apart so that they can figure out how best to frame their appeal. If one team out of, I don't know, 10 teams appeals and the other nine do not appeal, only the team that appeals gets the benefit of a grade change. It does not go to the rest of the class. So if these students want the benefit of a great appeal, they have to do it themselves. Uh, I also allow students to go to other resources. They can use the internet or other readings to help back up their appeals. Uh, it's helped me create better questions because students will help me during the appeal process reframe questions so that they're more clear and more effective. After you have this process in place a few years, you notice the number of appeals goes down and down and down because they're basically peer reviewing your materials, which is nice. So if you've got a team that's spending time... If you've got a team that's spending time researching to do an appeal, what are the other teams doing during that time? Or is this, do they do it, because they have to do it right? Yes. Immediately. Um, and it, it can be a problem. Uh, usually I give the students like a very specific amount of time. You have five minutes or you have 10 minutes to complete the appeal. Some students who aren't actively engaged in an appeal, you'll see them open up their email, open their Facebook, or just socialize during class. And since I give them a very clear amount of time, they know that, oh gosh, I have like three minutes or five minutes before we're going to be all brought back together. So some of the groups, I do lo lose them for a little bit, but they all tend to come back. Now we're moving on to the group application exercises. Uh, the group application exercises are questions that I've created for the entire class. Uh, each group will notice that I have given you cards. They're A, B, C, D, E cards so that you can look at the question that I'm posing, the different options that I have for answers, and you can identify which answer you agree with. So when we're going through the group application exercises, and there are four S's that I follow. It has to be a significant problem, so it has to be important. 
Everybody in the room, each team gets the same problem that they have to consider. Students have to make a very specific choice. They can't say, we think all of them are right, even though they do try to do that sometimes. And then we do simultaneous reports so that everybody's showing me what their answer is at the same time. A good question has more than one plausible answers because it's not about getting the right answer, it's being able to describe the why behind why you have that answer. Are you ready to try to do a group application exercise? Yep, nope, no eating peppers. I did stop by Ferdinand's and pick up some ghost pepper cheese. So if you've ever not, if you've not tried that, it's amazing, they're remarkable. Uh, but when you're doing this, feel free to use any resources that you have. If you want to get on the internet and look things up, feel free to do that. I'll give you a few minutes as a team to talk about the case that I'll be presenting, and then I'll ask the teams to present their answers with the A, B, C, D, E cards. After you hold up the cards, I will randomly call on groups within the room and ask the groups to describe how they came to their answer and why their answer is better than the other answers. So here is the question. Read it on your own and then start discussing with your group. One right I'm sorry? You can use any resources you want. Everything's fair game. Everything's fair game. So I'll give the groups two more minutes to talk and determine their answer. Or 
All right, so about 15 more seconds. Determine your final answer. Okay, so on the count of three, put up your answer. One, two, three. Okay, so we have an A and we have a B. Can you, the team that chose B, can you tell me why B is a better choice than A? Well, we found some stuff on the internet that says that dairy products, alcohol, sugar, chocolate, and bread are the five top remedies. So we thought that right, the frozen yogurt has dairy, it has the sugar, and it has bread. So it has three out of the five top remedies of why of what you can do to get rid of wild spicy. And if it's chocolate yogurt. And and it could be chocolate frozen yogurt and then it would get four of the five remedies. And why we didn't want <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking about choice number four A, but why we excluded it? Because it's based alcohol based. Okay. We know that it does help, but it's in the test. <laughs> That's why we decided, well, not the best choice, not the best example. <laughs> so the team that chose A, can you tell me why you chose A over B? So back to the team that chose B, uh, what website did you use and how do you know that that information is credible? <laughs> oh, it was the number one result on Google. Okay. 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 Oh. What do you think about their uh, use of the number one result on Google from a scientific perspective? Is that the best approach that they could, could have potentially taken? Or is there a better approach? Most reliable, credible source isn't necessarily the number one. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's nice about these conversations, initially, when uh, students are engaging in these converse, conversations about the group application exercises, they're really careful not to be offensive to anybody else in the room, and so they won't really debate very much. So as a faculty member, you have to kind of facilitate that debate, try to poke some holes maybe into some of the thought processes so that you can refine your students' thought processes. As the semester goes on, they will start calling each other out. So this group may have potentially said, well, how do you know that that website, that resource is a good resource? So not only are the students learning about peppers, and treatment of uh, the burning that's, that's caused by the peppers, but they're 
taught about additional things like what information is valid, how do we use this information on the internet. And I don't know what's better. Probably A and B are the most reasonable options. I think the alcohol is going to have a little bit of an effect uh, longer term to help kind of relieve that pain through some of its properties. But the large frozen yogurt in a cone, it has the sugar, it has the dairy, it has that carbohydrate. So that's probably going to work also. Uh, if I were to choose one, I don't know. I would probably choose A as long as it isn't in the middle of the day. If it's in the middle of the day, I would probably choose B. Sometimes when I'm going over the answer, sometimes I won't even tell the students what I believe is the right answer. It drives them insane. Okay, here's another question. So take about well, two minutes. Consider it, and then I'll bring you back together, and we will talk about it. So I have a question. Sure. Um, do you always hand out things that are this ambigu yeah. Ambig ambiguous? I can't think. So I'm sorry to interrupt your discussion, but there was a question. And uh, the question was, do I always have questions that are this ambiguous? Most of the time, I try to make them more ambiguous uh, rather than being perfectly clear uh, because it's all about the why. And if you have everybody in the room who puts their card up and everybody has A, what kind of discussion can you have around that? It's not great discussion. It's better when things are ambiguous. It's better when things are gray. Uh, within pharmacy, within the practice of pharmacy, there's huge gray areas. And so it's not too hard to come up with questions so that students have to identify what's the best treatment for a patient given their specific factors. Because sometimes there can be two or three really good answers based on how they defend their answer. And then do you do this with lower level classes or only upper level or graduate level? Um, have you tried it at other levels and seen it work more effectively or not? I think it can be uh, uh, delivered in any level as long as you modify it for the content that's being delivered. I did it for an Applied patient care lab worked really well. Introduction to therapeutics, top 200 drugs. I've heard about basic sciences using it, English courses, ag cor courses. So I think that it really, it really runs the gamut. Uh, the thing that I found that makes this less effective is when you don't have enough teams so that you can't have good discussion or you have questions that don't follow the four S's so that it's the same question. They have to make a specific choice. Um, it is not relevant, but I can't remember the other S and then the simultaneous report. Yeah. Okay, so are you ready? Do, have you had enough discussion to make your choice, A or B? So on the count of three, let me see your answer. One, two, three. Oh, B, okay. Everybody has the same B answer. So let's start over here. How did you, oh wait, I started here last time. Let's start here and make it fair. So how did you come up with B?
Do you have anything to add to the comments that were presented by this team? Uh, I think we've chosen for the same reason. The only issue we probably have discussed though is that we need to plan other people to engage in that process and then we can fire them. Yeah. Yep. So the subjectivity could be a problem with the heat scale method. What are some of the additional problems that you identified with the HPLC? So this one, there could be some variability, the high pressure liquid chromatography. What were some problems? It doesn't measure all of the chemicals. And why would that be of concern? Yeah. It's not there because because he wants to do each batch of peppers, and that's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. I worry. I wonder if through I R I R B within the university, if B would be okay, depending on the types of peppers that you are actually testing. So, what are you putting people through to yeah. test this? something to consider. So there are probably advantages to, and disadvantages to both of these. Uh, the, neither one is perfect, and we probably need to come up with a, another option that is a little bit more friendly to individuals, but also accurate at the same time that picks up on all of the different factors. OK, now we go back to learning objectives. Any questions the group has about the learning objectives related to peppers? Yep, and I think that's reasonable. I think that spending more time and figuring out what the main compounds are would be a really good idea. That's probably a flaw within the development of this so that we can go beyond the seeds, okay, what are those other compounds? And dig a little bit more deeply into that. And so we could have done that through a group ap application exercise, or that could have been something that was embedded within the initial reading. All right, so that is the end of the team-based learning process through the, the pre-readings, the individual readiness assurance test, the team readiness assurance test, the uh, process where you can challenge the questions, the written appeals, and then we went through some group application exercises. The only piece that we didn't do was that summative assessment of individual's knowledge. But by the time you get to that summative assessment of individual's knowledge, you've had so much discussion about these topics that you have pretty good confidence that the students in the room will probably do well on that summative assessment because they've been exposed to the material formatively so many times. Questions about TBL? How would I do summative assessments of them? Uh, right now in the College of Pharmacy on the Spokane campus, we have 130 students, or 135 students, and then in the, our Yakima campus, we have about 35 students. So for 170 students, uh, our main assessment approach are multiple choice exams, just because we have so many students and we have to get results back to them in a pretty quick turnaround time. Uh, but you can assess them pretty much in any way that you want to assess them. Uh, you could have questions and then fill in the blanks or open-ended questions that the students could respond to, basically any assessment method that's currently being used within this university. Additional questions? Do you use the team-based learning every time you use the class, or is it like you lecture sometimes and do this sometimes, or what's that? In the College of Pharmacy, we've completely flipped our curriculum. So we have to, we're, we're supposed to move away from lecture. Sometimes within team-based learning, I will take time and I will do a five to 10 minute lecture for the students. If I feel like there's something important I want to talk to them about, 
that's harder to express in pre-reading or in any other means. So I, I do a mixture of both. Uh, the classes that I've integrated in team-based learning, uh, I do probably between 70 to 80% team-based learning, and then I'll have some other activities in there depending on the class. Because some of my classes uh, that I've taught in the past have been skills-based courses. So I would have to teach the students like how to give immunizations. And that's not something that really works the skill itself through team-based learning. There are other things that harm through using team-based learning? Um, there's at least one other faculty member who's using team-based learning. Uh, we have a number of faculty who are using problem-based learning and a ton of different modalities to do the flipped classroom approach. Well, thank you everybody for being here. If you have any additional questions for me, always feel free to contact me. Also, there's a team-based learning website that is pretty good. And I also have a handout that breaks down all of the different portions of team-based learning. So thank you, everyone. What's the logistics of using this in your classroom as a student? So uh, using a TA is huge so that you can keep track of the scoring because the scoring can become labor intensive, especially, especially when you have appeals and you have to go in and manually update their scores. Uh, students are really good about scoring themselves and totaling it up as long as you train them. So I think it's just about setting up processes within the first few weeks of class so that it runs a little bit more automatically. But the back end grade entry can be a little onerous.